Okay, geographers, let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk plate tectonics. So what I'm going to do is, right, like, here's the deal, all right? The theory of plate tectonics, incredibly important, uh, and unfortunately, but also it just kind of goes to show how useful this thing is, it's not as simple as just here, you know, it's a one or two sentence definition and we're good. Uh, it's a complex theory, and I think the best way to really get a sense of how it works and what's going on with it is to go through the history in which this whole theory came to be. And I just, I think it's useful. It might be because I'm more of a historian uh, than a geologist, uh, so that's how my brain works. I'm like, sorry, you gotta just go with how my brain works, because I'm the one doing the teaching, right? Uh, so, I mean, you feel free, you know, read through the book, read through Wikipedia, look at, like, look at all sorts of stuff to, to get a sense of how it is in simple definitions, but I'm going to take the time here to go through and explain not just what it is, but how we came to figure this stuff out. And it also, it, it shows kind of the messiness of how science works. It helps dispel some of the myths that we have, and it's it's a myth that like scientists like to to keep showing uh, to and, and propagating and, and to let non-science folks just continue to believe. But it really it goes to show that, that scientists aren't perfect. Uh, there are people who are quite brilliant to advance an idea, and everybody says, you're wrong, and then eventually time shows that, oh no, they were right, you're all dummies. Uh, that works. Um, quite a bit. Uh, you, you see examples of this stuff. And what scientists do, and what drives me crazy, and why science itself can drive me so crazy, and that's why I've yelled at you guys about STEM and all that stuff, uh, is that scientists are so smug and content. Not all of them. There's some good ones out there. Um, but so many are just content to just go like, well, I mean, of course we know what we're doing. We're scientists. But the whole idea behind science is to admit that well, actually, I have no clue what's going on, but I want to get to the bottom of it. I want to figure it out. So we'll see really how science works for better or worse. But the result is this incredible understanding of why the planet is the way it is. And another reason why this is so important is because we find that plate tectonics affects everything. Uh, right now, as I'm recording this, it's an incredibly windy day, not a surprise, being here uh, uh, in beautiful Palmdale, California. Here in the Antelope Valley, we get heavy winds, right? That actually, and I got into, you know, this idea of winds and pressure gradients and all that stuff, but really, um, at its core, we have these winds because of plate tectonics. And you'll see as I'm going through, hopefully that'll, that statement will make sense, but there's a lot of this stuff. When you really get down to it, it's all plate tectonics. It's that's who's to blame for these these various things. So that's why it's worth taking some time to get a sense of how this stuff works. Okay? And I mentioned too, I think I did this with the physical geology lecture. I, I stress that the general idea, right, is that the Earth is uh, it's broken, right? This I showed this very uh, uh, slide in that thing. So it's the idea that we have these different plates at work. In fact, I'm going to go to my cool laser point. In fact, can I, I saw this last time. What is, oh, that's, oh, that looks just so much cooler. Um, I will save you green. Uh, so uh, it's the idea that we have the Earth's crust is broken into these series of plates. Okay, so the crust is the outer layer we have the core, both the inner and outer core. It says here the inner core is solid, the outer core is a liquid. The inner core actually, here's one more cool thing. It's it's all liquid metal. We're dealing with, you know, nickel and iron and all that down here. The inner core it's hot enough to be liquid, but because of the pressure, because literally the entire earth is pushing down on it and squeezing it, it's incredibly hot, but it's solid. The molecules can't move. It can't behave as a liquid. Which, like, don't even try to really think about that. Because you'll know it'll start to bleed and you, you can't. It's like, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, it's a super hot solid. It should be liquid, but it's too much pressure. Then the outer core, 
is simply where this metal kind of churns around. And as that metal is churning around, is moving around, it produces a magnetic field. That's our magnetosphere. Well, I've talked about it before when we were talking solar wind, um, but we're going to get into, uh, talk about it a little more today. Okay, so this churning metal makes this magnetosphere, makes our invisible force field that goes around the Earth. And we have the mantle here. Uh, we have the asthenosphere, which I'll be getting into um, in a bit because that's important. That's what our plates are actually floating on. So we'll discuss that. And then above that, we have actually, we have a little bit of mantle material above that, but then we have the crust, which is a very thin amount. This clearly is not drawn to scale at all because the crust itself is uh, incredibly tiny compared to everything else down here. And we have two types of crust. So we'll be getting into that, but we have oceanic crust, stuff that makes up our big continental masses. And then we have, uh, um, I, said, I can't even remember what I just said. Uh, the continental crust, is that what I said? Um, it's primarily granite. That's what makes up our continents, hence the name. My brain, I think I swapped those. Um, but continental granite, it's less dense, but but more thick. There's more distance. It's roughly 20 to 40 miles thick right here. And then oceanic crust, the stuff that makes up the seafloor, that's primarily basalt. It's more dense, much thinner, about three, four miles thick. All right, so we'll, we'll get into some of the distinctions there. But this crust, whether it's continental or oceanic, uh, what we have are these different individual plates that are floating on the asthenosphere, and they're they're moving around and they're bumping into each other and all that. And that's the general idea. We're gonna get into why we care. I mean, yeah, that's kind of cool, but there's actually there's some pretty important stuff that goes along with this fact right here. So that's what we're gonna get into. All right, and one way just to to kind of put this into perspective too, uh, to think about like, why we care uh, is really you know all the ways in which the Earth can kill us and how they are related to plate tectonics. Uh, I, I mean, there's plenty of stuff. We'll all continue to talk about more stuff. I've already spent plenty of time talking about dying from this or that or you know that or, or whatever. We'll we'll get into more stuff, but some of the really scary stuff. That's plate tectonics, right? Chile, oh, love it. it just, I mean, what a great country. I mean, yeah, the wine is good and oh, all the beautiful people, but what I really love is just how screwed they are in terms of incredible earthquakes. I mean, this is just a greatest hits right here, but by no means, you know, an exhaustive list. Um, but we'll go down here to the bottom. May 21st, 1960. Magnitude 7.9. Now, we're not getting into, I'm actually skipping earthquake stuff. I'll inject some things here and there, but magnitude, what we're talking about is the actual power, the energy released from the quake event itself. When these two sides of the fault block, when they slip and release that, that energy that is released, that's the earthquake, and we measure it in magnitude. Okay, so a 7.9, that's huge. If, and, you know, most recently, the most devastating and recent one that we all think of here in Southern California is the Northridge quake back in the 90s. That was like a 6.4 uh, magnitude, right? Devastating, incredibly powerful, but a baby compared to the 7.9. Okay, so much, much bigger, much more significant uh, here. So, but that, but then here's the crazy thing. I mean, this was awful. But it turned out that was just a foreshock to the actual main event, which happened on the next day, which was a 9.5, which is record tying in its you know size and the enormity. I mean, that's apocalyptic level stuff right there. And did the Chilean people just give up and say, we're done, we're moving to Peru or Argentina? No, they just kept doing their thing. We fast forward up here to February of 2010. We have an 8.8, .8, another one that like we Californians, we like to say we live in earthquake country. I mean, we had that that Riverside uh, uh, or not River Ridgecrest one um, last 
this last summer. I don't even really remember what the official magnitude was. Like, that's how, like, it was cool, I say, living miles away from it, uh, not living in a trailer in Trona or Ridgecrest or whatever. I mean, there, yeah, people clearly suffered out there. It was a shame that we quickly forgot all about it, um, even though, yeah, these are like four people who suffered from it. But for most of us, like here in the Antelope Valley, our houses shook, and it was awesome. And I remember, like, my kids got, like, my daughter was crying uh, a little bit. And I was, you know, I was worried, trying to get them downstairs, make sure there wasn't something else taking place. But honestly, I wasn't expecting, like, a 9.5 to show up the next day, because it's California. It was like a 5 point something, right? No big deal. Cool stories to tell to people who don't live here. Impress my family in other parts uh, of the country. But that's it. This 8.8, if we had that happen here, we would just, like, we would just all die. Um, not from the shaking itself, but just the stress. Uh, we couldn't deal with it. Chilean people, ain't no fan. Uh, and I had, at this time, I had a student whose family lived in Chile. She was Chilean, and she was talking to me about it, and she had spoken to her family. I said, like, what are they, how are they feeling? What are they doing? Tell me what's going on down there. And, and her response to her family just was kind of like, eh, what are you going to do? Right? It's, you know, this is, this is life. Uh, we just keep moving on. That's awesome. Uh, we're crying how we're survivors for that five uh, magnitude one uh, at Ridgecrest. These folks are just like, all right, you, you got to go to work tomorrow. I mean, that's hardcore. And then you can see 2014 and 8.2, 2015 and 8.3. It's ridiculous. And it's all because of plate tectonics. And so we have our earthquakes here in California because of tectonic activity. But we also have different tectonics at work. So while we're earthquake prone, we're nothing like Chile. And I think, yeah, let me show you here. What we have, the reason why we have this happening in, here's Chile down here, uh, it's because of the Nazca plate getting shoved underneath the South American plate. The zone of compression, we'll get into these different boundaries. But as this oceanic plate gets, which is uh, more dense, Right As it runs into this less dense South American plate here, the less dense thing floats on top of the more dense thing. It's the same way your rubber ducky floats in the tub or whatever. Right, Things that are less dense float on top of things that are more dense. That's what's happening with these plates. So the Nazca plate actually gets shoved underneath, and as it's getting pushed under and this movement is taking place, that's what's driving earthquakes in this area. Here in California, we have a different type of boundary where the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate aren't crashing into each other. They're sliding past one another. All right? And so that makes, yeah, earthquakes are possible, but it turns out it's not quite the same deal. And so this is showing, you know, plates themselves and, you know, I'm talking earthquakes, but the red dots here, we're looking at volcanoes, which is another thing. It's like, sorry, Chile. You got that stuff to deal with, too. Um, and everybody around the Pacific Ocean has to deal with this stuff. And we call it the Ring of Fire. Just this fact that on the edge of the Pacific Ocean, we find these incredibly explosive, powerful volcanoes. Turns out it's not some coincidence. It's all connected to where these plates are. You know, one is getting pushed under the other plate. Right? We don't see that as much here in California. Like we have uh, volcanoes, and yeah, we're not even going to talk about it. We have some up in Northern California. We've got volcanic activity here, but we don't see these really scary things down in Southern California because we have that sliding uh, action going on. But up here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a little bit of that subduction happening where that oceanic plate gets shoved underneath. So subduction is the term. That's where we have incredible uh, volcanoes like Mount St. Helens. And it continues around Alaska and over here into uh, you know, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, the South Pacific, and all that. It's all connected to these plates and how they're moving about. In fact, here's another one looking at the plates uh, uh, down here. It's also connected to earthquakes as well. If we look at where earthquakes are, Occurring, we can almost you know, map out the plates themselves. Not always, and we'll talk about hot spots and some other uh, exceptions here, but we see where these two or more plates 
come together. We have a lot of tectonic activity. We have a lot of hazards. We're also having crusted mountains and stuff like that. So plate tectonics, if nothing else, helps to explain some of the scarier things that we have to deal with. And so that's one reason why we're going to spend some time with it. All right, so just generically, kind of generally speaking here, I'll give you a basic rundown of what the theory of plate tectonics is saying. All right, at the top, the Earth's surface is covered by a series of crustal plates. That's what I was just talking about. It's broken, right? The plates float on the asthenosphere, so it's this weird component of the mantle, this plastic kind of silly putty-like thing, so we're kind of floating on that. Okay, but what we'll also get into is that the seafloor plates, the seafloor itself, it, it's constantly moving, okay, as well as being regenerated. We have new ocean floor getting built up in these undersea volcanoes, and that's causing this stuff to move, right, which helps all these other plates, the non-oceanic plates, you know, bump into other ones and so on. So that's what's causing these things to move in different directions. And the whole reason why the seafloor itself is starting this movement process is because of convection. The idea that heat rises, right? Hot stuff goes up, cold stuff goes down. And that heat, the whole convection idea, comes from radioactive decay taking place inside the Earth. And last time I talked about this concept that, that uh, we have these radioactive isotopes inside the Earth. They're unstable, they decay, they release these subatomic particles, which is what's, what's generating heat. And so that's why we have very high temperatures inside the Earth. And so those high temperatures, the hot stuff, magma, uh, will rise up. It will work its way up to the surface. That leads to these volcanoes erupting and, and then cooling inside the, you know, underneath the ocean at the base of the seafloor, and that's causing stuff to move, and so on. Okay, so this is the general concept. Now, I'm going to spend time, as I said, I'm going to go through, get into how we know this stuff, and that will hopefully help make sense of what's happening. And then we'll get into more of the, okay, so what does that mean, right? And so you'll hopefully, by the end of this, have a good sense of what plate tectonics is all about, and that will, in turn, hopefully make everything else we talk about for the rest of the class make a little more sense. Right? It'll help to answer some of these questions that, honestly, up until the 80s, we didn't even have really good answers for. Right? So that's another crazy thing, is that this whole theory of plate tectonics really becomes accepted um, in the sense of it's in textbooks. It's that it's stuff that um, people start learning and is the, the dominant paradigm of, of geology, that's in like the early 1980s, when it all comes to be. So that's another crazy idea to think that we just didn't know that this was going on up until, you know, roughly 40 years ago. It's pretty, pretty new stuff. All right, so here are our plates as they exist. Uh, too, we've already seen stuff that kind of looks like this, but also you can see, just to connect some of this stuff before we get into the history of the theory, these arrows. And these arrows aren't perfect. They're very generic. Uh, and it's because uh, with these plates, they, it's not like a rigid thing that just moves. Like think like, you know, air hockey, um, where you have, you hit the puck, you know, from one side of the air hockey table to another. That puck itself all moves in the same direction kind of effortlessly, right? So if we think of that puck, um, as like one of the plates, that would be like if we just see this one arrow right here, just going this way. It makes it sound like something's hitting it over here, and the whole plate is just sliding in one direction. The reality, though, is that this is kind of the, the general idea of what's happening, but it's actually, it's being stretched in different directions. I've heard it described as more like a rubber sheet. It's not some solid, rigid thing that's all moving in the same direction. It's moving in different directions. It's meeting resistance here, getting tweaked here and pulled around. So we'll see, like, specifically, the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate along this boundary right here, pretty close to where I am recording this right now. We'll get into what that is. You might 
know what I'm talking about already, uh, but we'll definitely cover it. But the directions are different from what we see here. Okay, so it's not perfect like this. It's more complex, and a lot of that too is we're also learning more and more. This idea is roughly 40 years old. Well, you know that means that a lot more work has to be done for you know more understanding of this stuff. So we'll we'll continue to talk about some of the nuance as well as we go forward. All right, enough about that. Let's talk about continents in love. Now, have you ever noticed that? You ever looked at a map of the world or the globe or whatever, and you look down here, because uh, this is what it looks like today, right? You got Africa right here, South America over here. Um, I mean, they just, they just fit, right? Like pieces of a puzzle. They're just meant to be together. This is what they want, baby, right? And this, I love this image because it's also like, this is the only one I've ever found where you've got like Patagonia down here. It's, it's like it, it's South America's toes just wrapped around Africa. They're spooning, right? They're in love. They just want to be together. They're this happy little couple right here, and then something happened. All right, something happened where they just, I don't know, you know, you can speculate all you want. We'll never really know what upset Africa. Or was it South America? Or was it mutual? We don't know, but they drifted apart, right? You guys notice that? You notice the spooning? Yeah, you have. Of course you have. Maybe you don't think of it quite as romantically as I do, but still, it just looks perfect. How this should just go right there. It's an obvious thing, but I mean, come on, right? How could continents move? That's absurd. You ever stood on a continent? Of course, you don't feel it moving. We don't go, like, you couldn't go, uh, you know, over to the, the coast of Brazil and, like, look out. And, and see Africa getting further and further away or have some sense of movement taking place, it just doesn't work. So people, you know, you, the people speculated about this stuff but never could really do anything with it. And a lot of other people said, that's the stupidest idea ever. Ben Franklin, but currently, and I'm going to find where he wrote this stuff down, but I've heard that he actually was speculating that just based on maps of, you know, as... Europeans are colonizing everything. They're making maps of the world. He speculated, seeing South America and Africa and how these puzzle pieces could fit. He actually said that the Earth is probably, you know, like what we're walking on, it's like a cracked eggshell, right? So we're on this outer shell, and it's cracked, and these cracks can move around. But, you know, whatever. I'm going to go invent electricity and, like, democracy and, and all of that stuff, right? He just, he, like, he, he came up with kind of this, this starting point for the theory of plate tectonics, and then did nothing with it, moved on, and probably for the best, because as we'll see, it would have been really hard to prove this. So a lot of people saw this, but nobody could actually prove it at all. This idea that this guy and this guy, at the very least, if not everything else, were stuck together at some point in the past. Right? But then, you know, we got this idea, but we also have other stuff that people are discovering and noticing. We got this guy right here, little Mesosaurus, uh, who is this cute, I mean, you can see right here, tiny little, like, crocodile thing, right? And the tiny, cute, uh, with those razor needle teeth and weird tadpole tail and all that stuff. So the Mesosaurus was like this early alligator crocodile thing, and it dwelled uh, on co in coastal areas. Okay, so it wasn't like something that could go deep into the ocean, much like our, our different alligators and crocodile and caiman and these, these different creatures that we have that are all related but distinct species. Uh, they're not, you don't find them out swimming deep in the ocean, right? You won't you go like sailing across the Atlantic and see an alligator just, you know, after a stroll or whatever. They hang out on the coastline. Some, you know, spend more time in freshwater. Other species spend more time. Uh, in salt water and kind of in, in uh, you know, brackish water in these estuaries. But still, these things are coastal dwellers. They stay connected to a continent. Now, here's the problem. So this is a, you know, long since, um, uh, uh, you know, extinct creature. Uh, and so we don't have them today, but we're finding fossils of them like we see right here. But here's the problem. We're finding fossils in South America and in Africa. And we haven't gotten into evolution 
yet, natural selection and all that. But what we know um, today definitively, but was pretty much figured out early on with this stuff, is that you don't have species evolve spontaneously in totally different areas, okay? You, once you have that isolation, like you have something, uh, you know, evolve here, and have something evolve here, what we see is that they evolve into different species. So going back to like the idea that we have crocodiles, and we have alligators, and you know, these different creatures, they're different species, they're related, but they've evolved into different species precisely because they've been isolated, they've been separated, and it gets into the gene pool and mutations and stuff we'll talk about. Right, but it's it's why like in Australia they got weird looking stuff, right? You ever looked at a kangaroo? It's not it's not normal. Uh, and the reason we say it's not normal is because yeah, you know, we have mammals in every other continent here, but because they were isolated here, all the weird Australian stuff it evolves in a different manner. So to find the exact same fossils of or the exact same species fossilized maybe is a better way to say it in two separated, you know, by an entire ocean, these very isolated areas, that makes no sense whatsoever. There's no way that could happen. And remember, we're going for that simplest explanation. It gets back to Occam's razor, which I spoke last time with the historical geology stuff, right? So what we're dealing with here, we need some kind of simple explanation. And the best anybody could do is to argue that, you know what, there are probably some land bridge things going on. There's a land bridge situation going on where we had lower ocean levels, so that exposed a land bridge from South America to Africa. So these things, they were the same species because they could hang out. Their range was from here to here. Right? It's not that they swam across this massive deep ocean. It's that the ocean was different. And so it was kind of like a coastline running from these two places. That was the best anybody could come up with, like in the 19th century. Okay? And anybody who thought otherwise, well, it was, it was quite the leap. But luckily, we got this guy who shows up in the early 20th century, Alfred Wegener, uh, who is a geographer. Right? He, I mean, he is a geographer, not a geologist. I stress this because I'm petty. Of course, I'm, you know, what side I'm on. Uh, but I also think it's it's cool what he was able to do. But Wagner writes this book that is mind-blowing, The Origin of the Continents and Oceans. And in this thing, he proposes the idea of continental drift. Okay? The argument that the continents are slowly moving. They're moving apart. And sure enough, he is arguing that South America and Africa were spooning uh I don't think he used spooning. I don't know, my German's not good uh, enough, so I don't know if he actually said it in the original, in the translation. He doesn't mention spooning. Uh, but still, it's the idea that they were together, and they've drifted apart. And it's the general idea. And I bring up that he's a geographer, because what's crazy is, like, he was a climate guy, and he studied, um, you know, ice sheets and, and Arctic uh, you know, weather and, and climate and stuff like that. Most of the people who would study this kind of stuff, they would be geologists who were studying the material components of the continents. He was an outsider, and that's one reason why a lot of people said, what does this guy know? Right? He doesn't belong. He's not part of the team. So well, how, you know, how could this, this weird weather guy, I mean, look at that hat, he couldn't know what's going on. So people rejected it because of that. Other people rejected it. And we'll get through into his evidence and, and more about this stuff, but they just thought, no, no, that's crazy. Continents moving, it's ridiculous. And spoiler alert, we'll find out he was, he was right. Generally speaking about the idea, he had some stuff wrong, but this idea of continental drift, yes, it is correct. But back in 1915, when this book drops, no, it's not accepted at all. Okay. Now, one big component, and this is kind of the fun, sexy component of the book, too, is his idea of Pangea, which literally, when we break it down into the Greek, it means one Earth, effectively, or all, uh, you know, Earth together. You want to think of it that way. It, Pangea is a supercontinent. 
which means that every single continent we think of today, so there's North America, we got Asia, and Europe over here, Africa, South America, uh, this is what will become India right here. So you can see more or less what we're dealing with today. They're all stuck together into one massive continent, or you can think of it as just one gigantic island and therefore one gigantic ocean all around it, right? So he proposes Pangea. Now we know today that yes, Pangea existed. So another spoiler alert thing, absolutely right on this. He had the timeline screwed up. Uh, we know today it formed about 300 to 250 million years ago. And it's fuzzy. This is one, like when I was talking about absolute dating, I got into how sometimes the numbers, it's still an absolute date, but we've got 50 million years of wiggle room. But it's this argument of when exactly does it form, right? Because maybe it's obvious that this is coming together right here 300 million years ago, but maybe this stuff, it's closer to 250, right? I mean, that's where like to say, you know, instantly, okay, you know, now it's a supercontinent. It's a little vague, but just, you know, no, and this is a good number to, to have, you know, in case I test you on it, hint, hint, uh, but just know that it's roughly 300 to 250 million years old. And when you think about it, how old is the Earth? Oh, wait. Right, exactly. 4.6 billion years old. This is 300 million, so 4.6 B billion, 300 M million years ago. There's no way that this is the only supercontinent the Earth has ever known, right? Nor will ever know. So we're, you know, we're now going even further with this stuff. Um, but sure, I mean, it, it, based on what we'll see here, there's no doubt that we had other versions of Pangea at other moments in time. If we go far enough into the future, we'll have the same thing happening, um, you know, in, in um, you know, on the planet in like another 250, 300 million years, right? But this, this Pangea here, the supercontinent, it breaks up through this concept of continental drift. So everything's cool. It's all one, you know, big mass here, but then it starts to drift apart. We learn more about why things would come together and then pull apart as we learned more about tectonics. But this stuff collides and then pulls apart, and that's how South America and Africa break apart, as well as everything else that we see here, right? That's the general idea of Pangea. And that was all Wagner's concept. Uh, now, that concept of Pangea, continental drift, all this stuff, fantastic. And as I've said, this is what we accept today, as what has happened with our continents over the last few hundred million years. The problem, though, was that Wagner didn't have a good driving force for continental drift. He couldn't precisely say why continents were drifting apart. Now, he argued that it was centrifugal force. It's the idea of the Earth is rotating, and that's just causing the continents to kind of move about as the Earth spins around, right? It's That's not the case. That is incorrect. And so not having, you know, and just that idea of centrifugal force, kind of a weak idea. We didn't have like really good evidence of, yes, continental drift is happening and here's why it's happening, right? That's the driving force. So without having that driving force, that, that made this concept weak. Uh, and that's why a lot of people rejected it. But that said, he still had a great amount of evidence that he proposed. And I'm just going to go through and briefly show some of this stuff, what he was talking about. So we've got continental fit, looking at how the continents would fit together. Uh, rock strata, and looking at layers of rock, some specific mountain ranges around the world, and then fossils themselves. All right, so we'll go through these one at a time. Now, the fit idea, continental fit, that's spooning. Man, it just it just looks right. And some people argued, you know what? If you cut out, like you take a map of the world and you cut out the continents and you try to fit it together like a puzzle, it doesn't work perfectly. 
Right? And that gets into, and of course it doesn't work perfectly. Coastlines are very dynamic things. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why it doesn't fit perfectly. But actually, and we'll see, like underneath the uh, ocean water, you could kind of start to see how they fit. And we'll see examples of this. But yeah, just from the surface, it's not a perfect fit. But honestly, of course it's not going to be a perfect fit. And it's just, it's close enough. It's just so close um, that it, it really, this whole idea of coincidences, that seems kind of weak, right? That just, you know, that South America, again, this and this isn't the only perfect fit. If you bring North America over here, like stuff starts to look good too. And you can kind of witness this as it breaks apart here. Um, but still, that's just, it can't, come on. Quint, it just looks good. And that's not enough to base a whole, you know, hypothesis or, or uh, theory, you know, of, of this nature on. But it's a good starting point, right? It's a good place to be like, yeah, okay, there's something here. Let's push further. And that's exactly what Wagner did. And the next important bit of evidence is to look at just the geology of these separate continents. So we got into rock strata, the idea of these individual layers of rocks. And if we look at this, we've got Antarctica down here, part of South America, southern and, and eastern part of Africa, a little bit of the Arabian Peninsula here, India, Australia. So we can see this kind of these areas that are totally separate today, very far removed. But if you look at the actual layers of rock in here, we see some stuff that again, I mean coincidence is just a lame argument here something was going on right and so you get like you know what i'm not going to test you on exactly the order of this stuff but you can see like basalt lava flow so we got that here now that here got that here all from roughly the same era um you know as we go in you can see in australia on the edge here not quite the same as some of these other areas in terms of thickness but still they're there okay and if it was was just basalt dating from the same time period okay whatever right but then underneath that we've got sandstone right directly underneath that from about the same area and you can see we've got coal and we've got evidence of glacial activity not these different things you can see the time periods uh in which they're taking place it gets back to what i was talking about with uh the geologic time scale the jurassic triassic that kind of stuff uh so we can see that we have at the same time, the same geologic events taking place in, you know, at least five different locations. That's a coincidence that is so impossible. Like, that just doesn't happen by chance. I don't know what the odds actually are, but impossible is how we would describe it. That doesn't make sense. That so you would have, you know, this stuff forming. You'd have the glaciers forming, you know, and then you'd have the the coal bed, the jungle stuff, and the bogs to allow coal to form, and then you'd have the sandstone form, and then you'd have all the, these five separate big volcanoes that erupted at the same time and had the same, you know, chemical makeup and all that stuff. It just doesn't make sense. What's our simplest explanation, right? That this stuff happened perfectly in a row, five separate times over millions and millions of years, or is the simplest explanation that this stuff actually was all stuck together? This was all one area. And so instead of it happening individually, no, we had it happen once, right? That this lava flow, we'll just use this as the example, the basalt that we have up here at the top, that's not five individual volcanoes doing this stuff. This all happened at the same time in the same area, okay? And then after that happened, the area itself broke apart, all right? So we're looking at, these same things in different places, okay? Rather than having it occurring in these different places, it happened in one place, you know, like here in the middle where they would have met. We have the lava flows, we have the sandstone, glacial activity, all that stuff. It forms, everything's fine, and then that continental drift breaks Pangaea apart, pulls it apart, and places it in these separate locations today, right? That's the simplest explanation, not that it all happened at the same time, just coincidentally. All right? It's not a simple concept necessarily, but when faced with the evidence, 
That's our simplest and therefore best explanation. That Pangea, it was one thing, that's where the stuff formed, and then continental drift broke it apart. Okay, mountain ranges, another example of this concept, and a great example of these, uh, we can look at the Appalachian Mountains, which I don't know if you guys have been to, you're primarily West Coast people. Uh, have you been to the Appalachians? Anybody? Show of hands? No? One person? Okay. Um, it's, I mean, don't don't bother. Say, oh, garbage. Garbage mountains. I mean, no offense. I mean, if you're from the East Coast uh, and you grew up near the Appalachians or wherever, um, yeah, bless your heart. Uh, but your mountains are terrible. They're absolutely, I mean, look at this. Look at this soft roll. Look at these little, blah, 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 blah. they just look soft and and these are lame. Um, again, no offense. Everybody's special. Way to go, East Coast. You're fantastic. You're garbage. Garbage mountains, right? You can even look at this relief map of North America. And so we see the little Appalachians right here. And then we've got the Rocky Mountains, right? And we have the Sierra. I mean, this is just, these are mountains. The West, you know, the whole Western half um, of, of North America here just glory impressive and just fantastic Ugh. terrible terrible over here. again no offense east coast way to go you i mean you know you you got hurricanes you at least have that going that's pretty tough and hardcore we don't have that uh but these are terrible and the reason why they're terrible it's actually it's not their fault what happened if you looked back 300 million years ago the appalachians would have been amazing Right, and actually, if you go back that far, these don't exist at that point in time. So these, it's not that these are little baby mountains that haven't grown up yet. They're actually incredibly old mountains. Right, the oldest mountains we got uh, on the different continents, and it's because of when Pangaea came together. So we can see that these things are actually starting to form prior to that 300 million years. I think we date them roughly around 320 something like that, uh, that's when the mountains start to get pushed up, okay? And it has to do with the compressional forces at work where North America is colliding with Northern Africa. And so as that comes together, it pushes up the crustal rock and it makes the Appalachians, right? As well as some of the relief we have over here. And if we actually put Pangaea back together, we see it stretches all the way up into Northern Europe this was one massive, massive mountain chain that formed when Pangaea formed, when these separate land masses actually collided to make Pangaea. And so if we went back, let's say it's, you know, 270 million years ago, we go back and we can look at the Appalachian Mountains. Oh, they would have been incredible, right? Just like the, you know, the Rockies are today, just these fantastic things. But as Pangaea drifts apart, as these land masses break apart and move apart from one another, there's no longer anything pushing the Appalachian Mountains up, right? As well as these other ones that we're dealing with. Now we'll get, you know, other impressive stuff, like we've got the Rockies and, uh, you know, running through North America primarily, as well as our beautiful Sierra Nevada over here. We've got the Alps, um, you know, the Atlas Mountains. Uh, down, like we've got impressive mountain ranges that have since formed, but the original, like the Appalachians, to just talk with what we're dealing with here, these were amazing, but nothing's been continuing to push them up. It's no longer tectonically active um, in that sense, and so they're getting worn down. Still, you know, impressive they exist, right, if they're 320 million years old. Um, but I'm sorry, East Coast, they're just not, they're just not, I mean, I don't know. They may, you know, they throw I got wrote poems about them, but I mean, come on, come on, Sierra. All right. Well, in fact, here's this is a great thing. This kind of goes. To, I mean, the Appalachian folks. Am I? Am I right? Look at that. Blah. But what's cool about this? Well, I'll give it you know some cred here. Is that from the ground you would just see, you know, mountains. You know, put mountains in quotes, hills and stuff like that. But from above, you can see this this zigzag stuff going on the compression lines at work you can see the collision right the idea that it's a continent smashing into another continent here and pushing stuff up 
And then for 300 million years, that stuff has been worn down through weathering and erosion and all of that. Uh, but you can see that that pressure at work. And we'll see some other examples of kind of more modern stuff and see how things have gotten built up in this same way. All right, so that's the, the mountain lands. And then finally, this idea of fossils. There's our Mesosaurus again, looking kind of sneaky uh, in this image right here. And not so much terrifying like that original picture, but like a, a sneaky little manatee or whatever. Uh, this thing, so we see it in South America, South Africa right here. Um, it's not the only organism from the past, right? These extinct things that we find in fossil form uh, in separate areas. So we've got you know, these things, they're all not sexy, they're kind of dumpy looking dinosaur things right here. But we see them in separate areas, like India and Antarctica, pretty far apart, right? As well as, you know, the Congo uh, right here. These things are incredibly removed today. But what makes sense, again, that simplest explanation is the idea that these things all existed roughly, you know, around the same area. If we go back... 250 million years ago, whatever we date these fossils at, if you and all this stuff corresponds with the timeline for Pangaea, like it all makes sense. Um, here it's the idea that they, yeah, they were the same species because they were in the same area and then they died and they began to fossilize. And in the meantime, that once they became fossils, the place broke apart, and that's where we find them in these radically different locations. It's not that they existed in radically different locations. They existed in the same spot. That spot broke apart. Now they're in, they're, the same fossils are in different places. Does that make sense? Hopefully. I can't, I don't know why I'm even asking that because I can't see you nodding or shaking your head or whatever. But does that make sense? All right, so that's the idea. Now, there is some solid evidence in this book. I mean, it's a good sounding concept, but it wasn't accepted right away. And a good example from the American standpoint is at this symposium in the 1920s, Continental Drift and Wagner's ideas, they're put up for debate. Hey, it's like, are we, hey, geologists, are we going to go with this or not? Are we going to accept Continental Drift and Pangea? Or are we going to say hogwash and, and figure something else out? Right? And so they debate it and discuss it and so on. And they go with hogwash. They they shut it down. They say, sorry, this isn't correct. And the real issue, like the big thing, was that driving force, right? Again, why? Why are these continents drifting? Why are they colliding together and pulling apart and all that? It ain't centrifugal force. So what is it? And if you can't tell us what it is, well, then we're just, we're not going to accept it, right? It sounds good, but come back when you got a real real idea. And Wagner never was able to develop more uh, on this. He continued to do his geographic work, and he died I think it was in the 1930s. I forget exactly when, but like, oh, and he died in such an awesome way. Like, he was working in Greenland. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Greenland itself. He was somewhere in the Arctic, doing some research out on the, you know, this big ice sheet, uh, and he has to go back for, like, some supplies or whatever to help everybody else out. Uh, and he, like, volunteers to go do this, and he ventures off into the ice, and they never see him again. He freezes to death out there on the ice sheet. Awesome! That's how, like, any geographer wants to go. And honestly, I mean, you, that's how anybody should want to go. From what I understand, freezing to death, oh, the best. Uh, the best way to do it. Because the way it's been described to me, and look, I'm not questioning. I don't know how somebody could describe how you die when you die. Um, because you're dead, right, if it works. But the idea, it's not question it, the idea is freezing to death is uh, glorious because you, you're you walking along, you're like, man, it sure is cold. But then your body starts to just shut down and it says, you know what, it's not cold. It's warm, baby. And you go, man, I'm, oh, I'm getting all cozy and warm and sleepy and I'm just going to, I'm going to take this parka off and take that off and oh, look at the snow. It looks so comfortable. I'm just going to, snuggle in here and, and just kind of close my eyes just for a minute and, and you're dead right it's fantastic you just you go to sleep and you feel great as you do it that's phenomenal 
Um, so yeah, just something to think about. You know, if you uh, if you if you know you're gonna die, you go up to Greenland, and that's also why you know climate change is so scary. Um, not it's not for the polar bears. Uh, it's so that we uh, lose the chance to to die in this phenomenal way. Um, all right, I hope you're all putting this in your notes. Uh, so the point is, Wagner's idea gets shut down. Most people don't uh, go with it, and Wagner dies before the world actually realizes what a brilliant guy he was. Okay? So he doesn't actually get to see his ideas, but some of his students keep the ideas alive, and they keep going, but time progresses, and we have World War II. Okay? So we're now f moving forward to the 1940s, World War II, and this is when you know Americans are, are joining in the war effort, effort and it's, it's fantastic. Um, good old World War II. Good old war in general. You with me? And here's why. This is why war is so fantastic. Uh, it's it's because we do our best stuff uh, when we're trying to kill others. You know, especially foreigners. We do incredible work. And you, students of the Antelope Valley, residents of the Antelope Valley, living right next to Edwards Air Force Base, you know what I'm talking about. All right? You've all seen it, right? You guys seen the stealth bomber flying overhead, right? The thing that looks like Batman's airplane um, that flies overhead. It's not very stealthy at all if you've seen it. I mean, it's loud as hell, but it's also incredible. And it's the whole the stealth thing. It's like a radar or whatever. And it just looks cool. It looks like Batman uh, flying up there. I personally, I'm a huge pacifist. I don't believe in war and all that stuff. But I still, I pull over the car like I've had it driving along through town. And, and the stealth bomber flies overhead, and you can hear it, and you see it, uh, and I'll pull over, and I'll get out, and I'll salute. I mean, it's just the coolest thing in the world. It's The technology is incredible. I don't know if you guys have been. Like, I got to go out uh, on the Edwards. Get, I got, got the tour of that. Got to go on a tour of the NASA uh, stuff out there, and just, like, seeing the technology and hearing all the facts about the stuff. It's the coolest stuff in the world. And, of course, we build it so we can drop bombs on brown people, right? I mean, that's that's it. That's what we, I mean, not in World War II. We were less, it wasn't the brown people. It was some other people we were trying to go. But still, I mean, that's what we're doing today, right? Um, so we can't, we don't have any, like, COVID-19 tests uh, at all. We don't have ventilators and stuff like that. And we're finding that our healthcare system is horribly flawed, but you've seen them planes? They're incredible, right? And that's just, that's how we work. So, it, I mean, yeah, it's it's clearly, it's frustrating, our priorities. But we do our best work when we're trying to kill people. Uh, and World War II is a great example of that. A lot of great technology came from it that would then, you know, later become a part of, you know, everyday life. Um, so military technology eventually becomes something that the masses can use or it gets better when the military is working on it because of the big budget and they're able to mess with this stuff. But we also see, like in this case, um, you know, this wasn't necessarily for evil purposes, but it was a way of, you know, we were trying to kill people uh, and it helped us learn something new. Okay? And so it's out here at the Atlantic okay, where we, we actually, we figured out something crazy was happening at the bottom of the ocean. Okay? So out here in the middle of the Atlantic, if you haven't looked at this yet, you can see this lighter line um, running through here. Okay, And that means the lighter the color in the ocean with a specific map, it means the shallower it is. Okay, So if we look here, like along the east coast, we have this light um, blue, this kind of turquoise color. It's a shallow part of the ocean where it gets into this darker blue. It gets deeper. And as we get out in the middle... It's not, you know, quite the same as this stuff over here, but the the elevation, right, underneath the uh, ocean water there is higher out here in the middle. And my God, if we look at the shape of this line, what it, what it, look at, and the spooning, right? It's the shape, right? And we get up here, and then North America, Northern Africa, we got Europe over here. I mean, it's just this perfect shape right here. And we found this. Because we had to blow up some German submarines, right? The U-boats. The Germans had these incredible submarines. And they were just dominating the Atlantic and blowing up ships and all that. 
So we wanted to figure out, okay, what does the ocean look like? So where can these submarines hide and where can't they go and all that stuff? We started to map the ocean floor to, you know, to blow up Nazis, which is totally, I mean, that's, it's okay. When we're dealing with Nazis, we can blow them up. We can dedicate, you know, bombs to that, that endeavor. That's, that's totally fine. It's different from Browning. Um, but yeah, so we're trying to blow up Nazis and, and what's really crazy, this is fantastic, uh, is one of the guys who's, who's, you know, in charge of doing this stuff is this guy, Harry Hess, who's a geology professor and a naval officer during the war. And he's from Princeton. Um, and it was just perfect that you have this guy who's, you know, brilliant guy who's studying geology itself, who's starting to map the ocean floor, and I'm sure he was, you know, put there because of his abilities, but just that he got the data, right, of this mountain range that runs, if we go back here, through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we call it the Mid-Atlantic Range, uh, and it's a volcanic mountain range. And what Hess did, so not only did he map it, and they mapped it through echo sounding, so it's there, the pinging, um, they sent a little sound down, so like, you know, sonar and radar and all these other things, these different DARs that we have um, that exist, that's how they're mapping it. So nobody's actually going down, like, in a submarine and taking pictures of the ocean floor, that's how they're doing it. They're up at sea level, up here, sending the, um, the sound waves down there and seeing how long it takes them to come up. And that's how they can tell where it's deeper and shallower and so on. But he doesn't just say, like, hey, we got a mountain range under here. Isn't that special? He instead tries to, like, see why is it there, right? What does this mean? And he'll later, in the 60s, publish his history of ocean basins. And he, what he's doing is he's arguing for this concept of seafloor spreading. And he's kind of got it drawn here, what he's trying to show. It's the idea um, that these volcanoes that we have underneath the ocean... Okay, down at the ocean floor, we've got magma coming up, it spills out as lava, it cools, it forms new basalt, but what that's doing is it's pushing the seafloor apart. Okay, so it comes up, goes out, uh, and pushes the seafloor out, so either side of the Atlantic Ocean is getting pushed in the opposite direction. All right, that's his general idea here. Uh, and here are some images to kind of help. First, we have a little cartoon going. So it's just showing the idea. This magma comes up, what we call magma upwelling. It's the idea that, you know, convection. Hot stuff rises, so this hot magma is working its way up. When it spills out, remember, it's magma when it's inside the earth, lava when it escapes. And so as that spills out and cools and makes this basalt, great, we have new rocks forming, but it has to also then push the other rocks away, okay? And this is, of course, sped up. If you were to go, like, in a submarine down to the bottom of the Atlantic or any of these other locations, uh, you wouldn't see this happening. It doesn't look like, you know, two treadmills going in opposite directions. It's a very slow process, but it's the idea that this is, the ocean floor is moving. Right? And then what also happens, because you could argue, well, okay, if this happens, why isn't the Earth getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? As the seafloor grows, it's because we also have these areas where that older seafloor gets shoved underneath, in this case, like we were just talking about, Chile. Uh, so South America is here, the Pacific Ocean stuff, that Nazca plate right here, that gets shoved under. Uh, and we'll see, I'll show a little more of the stuff in a bit, but it's not just the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This older stuff gets shoved underneath um, some other, you know, plates, and then that melts down and it returns to magma. So it's not that we keep growing, it's this recycling process. And so it's, it, but it's still, it's like this treadmill idea, but instead of growing, it's just, it's recycling, right? It's going up, moving over, getting forced back down, kicking back over, coming up. And so it's this constant cycling, what we today call a thermal convection cell. Same thing over here, right? So that's the general idea. And the problem is, even though we have a map of this cool mountain range underneath the ocean, 
well, there's still not enough there for everybody to go like, oh, okay, yeah, there are no, no more questions. That's perfect. We can't see the ocean floor spreading, even if we know it is, in fact, taking place, right? So it's a great, Hess does great work, but it's still not enough. We don't have that, that perfect evidence, that, that clear driving force. I mean, it's theoretically, it sounds good, but we can't actually see the ocean moving. There's no proof that that's exactly what's happening. Okay, so that's that's that. And Hess dies. He dies like in 1968 or something like that. Not too long after he publishes this book. And he's, he's held up. He's a brilliant guy. People respect him. But I think he has a heart attack um, and dies before plate tectonics is a thing. Right? So he's, and he's clearly, he's helping to lay the groundwork just like Wegener did for the theory of plate tectonics, but we're not quite there, okay? And what will really happen to turn this around is an increased interest in the magnetic field, going back to our magnetosphere, right? And in this case, we don't have one individual person. We actually have a bunch of scientists working on this same problem, which honestly, despite all these individuals I mentioned, that's how this stuff really advances. Typically, one person gets, you know, all the credit, but it's multiple people working here. But in this case, we don't have one individual that can even be singled out. We have a bunch of us trying to make sense of our magnetosphere. And so it's the idea, again, that our liquid outer core, it's moving around, that metal is churning and spitting around, that produces a magnetic field that exits the, uh, the planet. All right, and so we have also, we have polarity, where we have a clear north pole and south pole of the magnetosphere. So in polarity, like we see that if you play with, do you guys play little magnets and stuff when you were a kid growing up? Right, if you're shaking your head, um, like if, you, if you're nodding, you're saying like, yes, yes, I did. That is great. Your, your family loved you. Uh, if not, my God, that's tragic. Uh, and go out. Actually, don't go out. My God, stay inside. Uh, but order from an appropriate uh, place that's treating the employees well. Uh, order a magnet kit. Oh, it's fantastic. And maybe you have like the little Thomas trains. Uh, my kids went through that phase and those work. They had polarity. But it's the idea that if you have a North Pole and a South Pole on a magnet, if you put two North Poles of two separate magnets together, what happens? They repel right? They don't actually stick together. They push apart, which honestly, that's the greatest thing. That's the closest thing we'll have to magic ever or the force or what. I mean, it's just phenomenal. You try to push them together, but they, they don't, they don't do it. They don't want to touch. But if you flip one around, so now you have a South pole and a North pole and you try to touch them together, they attract, right? They link together. They touch, right? That's, that's cool. And that's what our planet has going on. Now, and I don't, I mean, you could, I guess, theoretically, you could take our planet and another one with a magnetic field that has polarity and you could like stick them together, maybe. Um, but that's not what we're worried about here. But the idea is that we have a clear magnetic North Pole. And what's crazy is that the geographic North Pole, which is if we follow lines of longitude, we call that geographic or true North. That does not line up with our magnetic north. So it's not perfect. Okay? We have actually what's called polar wandering. It's not only do they not line up, but it the magnetic north pole, it wanders. It moves. Okay? And it changes every year, just a little bit, but its location is off just a little bit. And we call this difference between the true north pole and the magnetic north pole, we call that declination. Okay, we, meaning land lovers, uh, in the Navy, like sailors, they call it uh, variation. Here on land, we call it declination. It means the same thing. But it's that difference between true north, or geographic north, and magnetic north. And that means, too, like if you have a compass, um, just a, a simple compass, you're not accounting for declination, where that north needle uh, swings, right? We think that's pointing to north. What it's actually doing is pointing to magnetic north, not to true north. So you could be looking at a map, you want to go true north, you look at your compass, you go magnetic north, you start walking, you're going away from where you want to go. 
And it just goes to show, like, to use a compass that actually takes skill. You need to you need to have a general sense of what this thing can do and what it can't do and all of that. Uh, sign up for Geography 201 if you want to learn how that actually works. Uh, but what's even crazier is this whole idea. We've got polar wandering. So the North Pole, the North Magnetic Pole, moves around, but it can also reverse. So the magnetic field, it weakens, gets, you know, weaker and weaker and weaker, and then suddenly just flips. So it says north up here, but in a geomagnetic reversal, north would be here, south would be right there. It's not fantastic. Why does that happen? We don't know. We do know that it's taken place at least nine times in Earth's history. So it happens. Uh, we don't know why, but we've seen evidence. And I'll get into where, you know, this evidence exists in a minute. It also, um, I don't know, nobody seems, like students don't seem to care about geomagnetic reversal anymore. Back in the good old days, like 2011, right before 2012, when the world was supposed to end. I don't know if you guys remember that. You were so young. Um, but yeah, the good old days when the Mayans, you know, the guys who were working with the aliens, uh, predicted that the Earth would, like, explode or whatever. And in 2012, um, yeah, everybody was convinced we were going to die, and a lot of people were saying we were going to have one of those geomagnetic reversals, and it was just going to kill everybody. No. It, even if it did happen, and honestly, the next one isn't supposed to happen for, like, a few hundred thousand years, I think, or something like that. Uh, but we've never seen, like, an extinction event occurring at the same time of one of these things taking place in Earth's history. There's not like birds will get a little confused. Um, you might need to buy a new compass. That's about it, right? So it's not apocalyptic, even if it does happen, but it would be crazy for things that rely on this for navigation, right? But the main point here is this thing has reversed in the past, okay? And the way we know this is through basalt, which is, I'm sure you all remember, mafic, right? Which means what? rich in magnesium and iron. Uh, and so what happens is as this lava is cooling, the iron in the basalt, it aligns with the current magnetic north pole. Okay? So it's like the lava is like this little compass, and the iron uh, in there swings toward north, toward magnetic north at that moment, and then solidifies, right? As it cools, it becomes a rock, lithifies, um, it's the term we discussed. So we've got this frozen compass, effectively. All this basalt, when it forms, it's pointing to wherever that magnetic uh, north field or pole is at that moment. So it's this great record. We can look at basalt, look at where these the iron is, is pointing in there, and we get a sense of what the declination was at that point in time, right? Where the magnetic north pole was in relation to the true or geographic North Pole. So that's pretty cool. And so what was able to be done uh, was to look in the ocean, right down at the seafloor, where it's all basalt, right? And we, we went down there, we drilled stuff, looked for um, the alignment, and we started looking at, okay, what was going on with the uh, you know, magnetic field, all in the interest of mapping more of this you know, geomagnetic reversal and getting a sense of declination and how this stuff changes, right? And I think I have, yeah, this is better right here. Again, we've got this thing going on right here, kind of showing that idea of seafloor spreading. But what's happening, if seafloor spreading is in fact occurring, uh, is that any rock that forms up here, so we've got the magma down here, comes out as, as lava, right? So cools solidifies right here, but it's pushing stuff out, okay, in opposite directions. So we got this moving here. I realize I'm doing stuff with my hands like I would in class. You can't see that. Um, but I have, so this arrow going here, this arrow going here. As this new stuff forms, it's aligned in a certain way. And this, so you can see these arrows pointing here, that's saying north at this given moment in time. But then as we have this reverse taking place, um, the North Pole is now in a different location, and this new stuff shows that. But you see what's happening here is with this spreading, new stuff forms, it's pushing stuff apart, but we get this mirror image on either side. 
right? So as it continues to reverse and even change, you know, just it doesn't have to be a full reversal, but just as we have this polar wandering occurring, we see the exact same polarity occurring in equal intervals on opposite sides of that mid oceanic ridge, right? On opposite sides, if we go back here, I think it's the same idea. Here's that volcanic mountain range running through the Atlantic Ocean. The red stuff would be current that's the newest, youngest rock. And if we look at the polarity, these different colors, the orange, the green, the light blue, this stuff, we see mirror images. They're indicating the same polarity, which is different. The polarity that's shown with the green right here, different from the blue right there, right? But it's this mirror image. That's the proof that this spreading thing is actually taking place, right? That it's it's like these two treadmills going in opposite directions. And once people started to piece that together, they went, holy cow, this is, this is like the C4 spreading proof that we need. We're learning about geomagnetic reversal and the magnetosphere and all that, but we're also learning something about seafloor spreading. So that got people more excited. And we also found, as people started looking at this stuff, that when you looked at magnetic polarity, what we were finding in the ocean didn't necessarily match with the stuff that we found on continents that were dated to the same period in time. So we have basalt down at the ocean floor that's, you know, it's all over the place there. We can still have basalt up on the um, on the continents as well. Might be slightly, you know, chemically different or whatever, but we still have the iron. It's pointing at that magnetic north pole at that moment in time. But we're finding that the magnetic north pole that's being shown in the ocean is different from what we're seeing on the continents at, you know, that same time. So that can mean one of two things. Either we had two magnetic north poles, if say we go back 100 you know, million years or whatever it is, which goes against everything we know about magnetism, physics, and all that stuff. So that doesn't really make sense. Or... Maybe the simplest explanation is actually that maybe these continents used to be in different places in relation to the ocean. And it turned out what happened is when you started to recreate Pangea and how the, all these continents were together and then broke apart, once we recreated where they were with that ocean polarity and the continental polarity, the stuff lined up. It showed that, no, we didn't have two North Poles, which... Makes no sense whatsoever. No, there was Pangea. And now everything is clicking. And so this leads to this massive project. It's a huge international thing. But you can see from the late 60s to the early 80s, we have people drilling everywhere to record this stuff. And we finally get the proof that we need for both continental drift and seafloor spreading. Right? Wegener publishes in 1915. His idea of continental drift and Pangea, it's 1983 when we go like, yeah, okay, yeah, this uh, this actually works, right? That's a huge amount of time. And it goes to show that science isn't perfect in the sense that we don't have, you know, the best idea just comes out and people instantly get it and we see the truth and all that stuff. But it also goes to show, like with science, why it is so it such a great way to learn about the world is because scientists do take their time. When it's done properly, we know that, you know, they, we're getting the right answers, right? So it goes, this isn't a story to show like, see, and that's why science is stupid. No, it's to say like science is hard and it takes a long time. But my God, once, if we keep pushing at this stuff and keep questioning and trying to figure stuff out, once we get there, we suddenly, we like everything changes we can we can see stuff in a new way and, and so much stuff makes sense so it's at the the conclusion of this deep sea drilling project that we go okay yeah something's at work here and so really what we're dealing with this is now we're ready for the whole theory of plate tectonics so seafloor spreading that's the driving force for continental drift all right so to be really clear continental drift is diff is it's um uh, one point, let me put it this way, it's one component of plate tectonics. Seafloor spreading is another component of plate tectonics, right? So now one of those is synonymous with plate tectonics. They're both 
important and they work together to help make this bigger concept. All right, so just to kind of go back here, it's this idea that we have magma coming up, right? This magma upwelling occurring, and that leads to these undersea volcanic mountain ranges throughout the, the oceans. And we'll see a bigger map of this stuff in a moment here, but this is like what's happening out in the Atlantic that you have the stuff coming up, volcanoes erupting, new basalt forming, so younger stuff here at the ridge. It pushes the older stuff away, so that's that movement. And the reason why this stuff is rising, it's because of convection, which and all this heat that's leading to the convection is because of that radioactive decay. So that's why this stuff keeps coming up, but we'll have subduction taking place in some different parts around the globe, and that causes some of the old stuff to shoot back down here, remelt. Uh, into magma and then that again because of convection will work its way back up and that can explain some other stuff that we see all right so there's a lot we're not even going to have time to over all the cool stuff that's going on but that's what's happening here that the the oceans and the continents and all this stuff it's changing and it's constantly changing in that geologic sense in that over millions of years yeah stuff is changing we can't see it on a daily basis like the the rate at which a lot of this stuff moves it's the same rate at which your fingernails grow okay so it meaning like you could stare at your fingernails right now do it you're looking at them you see them grow no of course not no you can't watch your fingernails grow but let's say like look at your fingernails now and then come back you know in two weeks and look at them and you go oh right like they've they've grown they've changed so it's happening we can't really witness it Unless we, you know, have some some break in when we look at it and then look at it again, right? It's the same thing with plate tectonics. And, you know, on our fingernails, a millimeter or two, that can look significant. But here in a place like California, do you notice a millimeter difference in the ground? No, right? So it takes millions of years to really have truly significant things showing up here. So it's a very slow process. But what this tells us is that the Earth is changing and has been changing and so these things that seem eternal like they've been around forever like mountain ranges or oceans or whatever it might be no some of these things are actually babies in the scheme of things they're brand new compared to the you know the entirety of the planet's 4.6 billion years and this is why this is a big deal it's not exciting just in and of itself that the oceans spreading or whatever or that South America and Africa were in love and spooning and boo boo. I mean, that's cute, but that's not like life changing. But what this really gets into is just the fact that everything is connected to the fact that the earth isn't done, that it's constantly changing and shifting and moving. Right? And we've since, in, in looking at this stuff, people have been doing work, and this is a painting, this isn't like a, a you know, a, a photograph or whatever, what's going on, but we found. That, yeah, we have these undersea mountain ranges all over. Here's that mid-Atlantic one that we've been talking about. But you run through the Indian and the Pacific. Like, we see evidence of this in different parts of the world, right? And, and that goes along with these different plates that we have. Okay, So it's this massive thing that helps to explain why we have oceans, where we have them. Um, and this incorporates, like, the whole theory of plate tectonics, what it's doing is it's helping to make sense of and explain this concept of magma upwelling. The fact that we have hot stuff inside the earth and it's working its way up to the surface. It helps to explain this phenomenon of seafloor spreading. The fact that we found, when we're blowing up Nazis, we found this whole volcano thing going through the Atlantic Ocean. Right? It helps to explain continental drift while we're finding the same fossils on different places. But in a more kind of significant way today, it helps to explain earthquakes, right? Like I said, with Chile early on in California, and I'll show some examples of that in a moment. It helps to explain volcanoes, which unfortunately I don't have time to do a whole thing on volcanoes. Um, but that's like we have volcanoes in specific locations because of the upwelling of magma, um, because of these different plate boundaries and where these things interact. That's that's all connected. And then orogenesis 
a very fancy way of saying mountain building, right? Or mountain creation. Uh, and so the mountain ranges that we have, they exist because of plate tectonics. And then from there, like I was saying, these winds that whip through here, we know that's a result of the mountains, right? As air from the western side gets pushed up uh, and then crosses the mountains and it descends here, we get that dry, miserable wind coming in here. It's why we're a desert out here in the Mojave. It's because of the mountains, because of the Sierra Nevada, as well as the San Gabriels and all the mountains we have around us, right? The reason why we have those mountains around us is because of continental drift and seafloor spreading and this overall tectonic activity. So climate, and therefore weather, is all influenced, um, you know, a big part of it, I should say, because, you know, we talked about climate change and stuff happening up in the atmosphere. But like local weather, like winds, and in many cases rains too, that's connected to where we have mountains and, and where we don't, or where we have oceans versus where we have, you know, continents and all of that stuff. Right? This helps to explain not only why the Earth, you know, things are where they are and all that, but what that means for those of us trying to live on the planet. That's why this is such a fantastic and an incredibly important theory. Right? Something that we need to grasp. Is that all making sense? Uh, I hope so. And so since, you know, since the 80s, since this has all been... Uh, um, you know, figured out. We've since been refining our ideas of where these plates exist, how they interact. And again, I talked about the different arrows, and this one's a little more nuanced, but still, and this is just cute. Now Antarctica is just kind of spinning around um, right here. But again, it's it's still it's a it's a more nuanced idea of movement in here. But the key thing, and what I'm gonna I'll wrap up with here is we want to get into how these different plates interact. It's not just the fact that, you know, this plate is separate from this plate right here, but it's what happens when these things pull apart or push together or slide past one another, right? We find that that's really important in explaining what's going on, whether it's because you have mountain ranges or ocean basins or whatever it might be. So I just want to get through the three different types of plate boundaries, right? And therefore, how these different plates encounter one another. What's happening at the edges here, where these two plates interact, right? And so the whole idea is quite simple. We have three types of plate boundaries, and it's because we have three types of stress or forces at work on the, uh, on the Earth itself, on the plates themselves. We have tension, or what's also called extension, as right? so you can see it both ways, you'll probably see it both ways in the different graphics I have here. But tension is where things are pulling apart, where, you know, in the plate itself, um, or the multiple plates, we have things pulling apart in opposite directions. And what helps me, I like this one, because it's got uh, bulldozers, uh, that, that works with my brain, so you can envision the two little bulldozers pulling apart. Right here. We're not going to worry about faulting. I'm skipping that in the interest of time. I'm going to get all the stuff we need to get in the remaining part of the semester. We'll talk about folding a little bit. But um, this pulling apart, that's tension or extensional forces. We also have compression where stuff is squeezing together. So we've got them bulldozers pushing together, more like working toward one another, right? Uh, and then shear forces is this is where things are sliding past in opposite directions, right? So this bulldozer is pointing to the right, uh, and then this bulldozer is pointing to the left, right? And shear, it's kind of weird to think about, but like when you turn a steering wheel, say, you're, you're, when you're turning, that's shear force, right? And that you're, the hand on top is going one way, the hand on the bottom is going the other way. Do you guys remember driving? I don't. Um, you know, which is fine. Do you guys see the oil? Oh, that one is tied. There's no reason for it. It's negative. Like, people are paying people to take oil off their hands. It's amazing. This is a wonderful time. Anyway, it's not what we're talking about. Sheer force. Okay? Going in different directions. Okay? And so these three different types of forces at work will translate to what's happening with these three different types of plate boundaries. Okay? So we have number one, spreading. What are often called divergent 
boundaries. We have convergent boundaries and then transform or they're sometimes called transcurrent boundaries. And they're all connected to these three different types of stress on rocks and which will eventually, you know, lead to in the case of, you know, continental drift like Pangea breaking apart, lead to these separate plate boundaries. All right, so I'm just going to go through each of these and show what's significant. And at that point, you'll be, you know, experts in all of this plate tectonic stuff. So spreading boundaries. These we've already been talking about um, in the sense of this is what happened with Pangea breaking apart at Africa and North America and Europe and, and South America. Right. So it's all together. But then you have this this extension. Right. These tensional forces, this pulling apart or spreading. Right. Or diverging. So all this, this should all hopefully like click if you, you know, if you think about what the words mean. So as the stuff is pulling apart, what happens is quite often you have what's called normal faulting where it drops down. And so you can see here that these fault blocks where a basin is opening up and it's filling with water um, as this is occurring. There's still, there's magma coming up here, which is leading to that the extensional force at work, why it's doing that stuff. But over time, like in the case of the Atlantic Ocean, over you know 200 million years as that goes past, this has spread quite a bit. And so you have this big valley. You still have this uh, tectonically active area in the middle. You know, there's volcanoes there, but it's pushing this stuff apart. We have this spreading boundary. And so that's why like the Atlantic Ocean is the great example because it's so clear and seeing it there, but that's why it's there, why that's lower and why it's filled with water. It's because of the nature of this extension, how these spreading boundaries work. And we can also see some of this. I mean, all the oceans can be explained in this way, um, but we can also see it on land. Uh, and one great example is the Rift Valley of uh, East Africa. So along the horn here, and the horn of Africa, it's the thing that looks like a horn. Get it? Um, but this is being pulled away from the rest of the continent. And so we have this rift valley that runs through the east, like running through Ethiopia. <coughs> and, and you can see right here, I mean, that's, that's awesome, right? This big, you know, canyon or gorge or however you want to describe it. It's not how these things usually form. It's not like the Grand Canyon and the water is cutting through here and digging. It's that these two massive land masses are pulling apart. And right now, this is collapsing downward, but it's, you, you know, got enough uh, high relief here, so it's not filling with water. But eventually, this thing, and it's event like in 10 million years or something like that, the horn will pull away enough so that this will fill with water. And we'll have a new sea open up in this area. And if we look further to the north, the Red Sea, which is in between Africa and the Arabian Peninsula there, that's a result of this spreading. That's why the Red Sea exists relatively shallow it's also very salty there because of the confined little area and the heat and all that stuff but this that sea the red sea it opened up because of this spreading because of that pulling apart and if we go here here's this is the horn of africa the arabian peninsula this is another one of those things where it's like come on spooning right it just looks perfect it's just another one of these puzzle pieces and yes you can argue that well it's not perfect it wouldn't fit but again it's a case coastlines are are relatively dynamic new things if we drain the water we'd see how that would fit perfectly in there and this also uh you know it's the same thing this is just what happened with as i was saying like the atlantic ocean it's the same concept we've just had more time passing right so this has opened up bigger and bigger and so we have a massive ocean as opposed to this you know shallow shallow and narrow little sea in that area okay so that's our spreading boundary now the opposite of this is our convergent boundaries where we have compression right where we have two plates coming together being pushed together and so as they collide instead of having oceans open up we get the opposite we have mountains typically being built up in some way. Okay, and so this is the classic example. And this would be if we had two continental plates, so two 
hunks of granite, massive things. And this gets back to density, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but where you have two big hunks of granite, two continental landmasses coming together, they collide, and we get this folding that occurs. We can also have faulting and things breaking. But a lot of our really impressive mountain ranges that we have uh, are the result of this folding. Don't worry about anticline and syncline. We're not geologists. We're not going to focus on labeling all this stuff. But it means, right, you know, high point, top of the mountain, and the bottom of the mountain, and all that. And so the folds here, that's compression. It's a collision thing. It's where these two things came together and crumpled together, and we get some impressive stuff. And we'll see there's some distinctions between what type of plate, but still, typically what we're seeing is stuff gets built upward. Right, now, if we have oceanic crust and continental crust, and we've already talked about this a little bit, we'll get subduction. I don't know if we have, yeah, subduction right here for your spelling. Um, so what happens is, again, it's the density thing. So less dense, more dense, right? So this is going to, the continental crust is going to float over the oceanic crust. And so this basalt here gets shoved deep down back into the uh, earth, it's going to heat up, it's going to melt, and what we get from here uh, is typically a chain of what we call strato volcanoes, highly explosive, potentially deadly volcanoes, and so named strato volcanoes because when they really erupt and explode, the stuff they're exploding at, the pyroclastic material, that can go up into the stratosphere, right? It goes up into space, and that's fantastic. So really powerful, incredibly powerful stuff, um, but also impressive mountains like the Andes of South America. Gorgeous, impressive uh, mountains. They are volcanic. Um, this leads to, as this stuff is moving, that's why they have earthquakes down there, like we talked about with Chile, but it's also why they have spectacular volcanic eruptions as well, right? And that's all because of oceanic and continental crust coming together. Okay, we can also find um, some of the most impressive trenches out in the oceans, very air, areas of very deep, uh, you know, ocean water. We tend to think, I think naively, at least I did, maybe you're smarter than me, um, but just like as a kid, before I started learning about this stuff, that yeah, you got in the ocean, it's going to be the deepest out in the middle. Right? It's because you start walking from the beach out to the water and it just gets deeper and deeper as you go. But no, actually, the areas of, of greatest depth are quite often near like a continent where the subduction takes place. And so, what this is showing, well, yeah, we've got Siberia over here and Japan and China and Korea. Um, this is what we're, we're looking at over here. This trench, this dark area, that's a deep trench, that's where the subduction is taking place. So you can also, you know, have that occurring as well as, you know, Japan. It's got volcanoes, Mount Fuji and all that, right? So that's all connected to compression, these colliding or converging plates, and it's all connected to plate tectonics. Now when we have two areas of continental crust, so one big hunk of granite smashing into another big hunk of granite, we don't have subduction in the same way. Now you can have, like what this is showing here, this ancient oceanic crust, is yeah, maybe it started out as one of these subduction zones, but eventually one big mass of granite you know, runs into that other mass, and we have this mountain building that can be amazing, right? As, and it's that folding at work. Here's a great example. I think great just because it shows it's pretty clear what's happening. This is in Iran. Um, so we have the Zagros Mountains down here, and you can see this that idea of folding, highs and lows. It's like it's a, you know, collision zone right here. Now, if you're there on the ground or even at the top of one of these mountains, it doesn't necessarily look that significant, right? In fact, if anything, most of you, if you look at this, you're like, oh, it's detachable, right? It just kind of looks normal, um, that, but that's Iran. Um, but yeah, you can't really see the folding, but from space, if you look here, you can see that it's we have this area here is sliding into the rest of you know Eurasia uh, up this way and actually this helps to also explain why the Middle East has so much oil which again oh, it, 
oil, negative uh, prices. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. It's mind. It goes to show how stupid economics um, happens to be, even though it's also incredibly important because it runs the world. Um, but it's kind of mind blowing stuff. But regardless of you know the cost of oil at the moment, the reason why there is so much oil in the Middle East is because of this compression, because of these convergent plate values. So we go back here. There's the horn. Here's the you know rest of Africa, the Red Sea. So that's where it's pulling apart. But what happens is this is diverging. The Arabian plate is smashing into Iran, the rest of Eurasia up here. And so we get that compression resulting in this folding taking place. And the folding, when that occurs, oil actually gets trapped underneath there. So oil is flowing underneath the surface, just like water is flowing underneath the surface. But when it gets into these folds, it can get trapped and it just stays there. It's just hanging out in this area, waiting for geologists who know how to read this stuff to figure out, okay, right under here, there's going to be oil, right? And to drill down and, and suck this stuff up. So this is why like Saudi Arabia has the world's largest remaining oil reserve, like this whole area. It's just one massive container of oil underneath the Arabian Peninsula. That's why we're such good buddies with Saudi Arabia, right? That's why it's so unfortunate that we can't get along with Iran because they got some oil, right? And that's why we're interested from a geopolitical standpoint in the Middle East over here in the U.S., not because we're you know, just fascinated by the Muslim religion or, or, or Islam or whatever. Uh, it's No, it's because of the oil, and it's here specifically because of plate tectonics. Once again, going to show why this is so important to understand. Uh, and you don't have to go all the way to the Middle East to see it. You guys recognize this area? What are we looking at right here? It's local. You ever seen that? You ever seen that? What's, what's this road? Right, the 14. Good, good. Highway 14. Um, so this is, if you don't know what we're looking at, this is in a, a very far off place called Valencia. Um, Santa Clarita. This is down at the bottom of the 14 as you're getting ready to, like as it ends, uh, and you get on the 5 and, you, you know, they're going to L.A. or wherever, right? If you look, this is what I was talking about with the last lecture, you know, we blow up mountains to put roads through there. If you're driving down the 14, do not look at the road, right? And don't text. That's ridiculous. No, instead what you should be doing is looking out your windows and staring at anything but the road. Look at the mountains. They're fantastic because we can see the folds in here, right? You see this U shape. That's that compression. The San Gabriel Mountains, they exist because of that folding, because they got pushed up. And what's really crazy when you think about this is at this high point right here, that's actually at the low point of the fold. So in theory, if you went back in time, before this erosion was taking place, uh, this would have been, you know, much higher, right? This would have been the valley, and you would have had higher mountains going in opposite directions right here. It's incredible, incredible stuff, but that's why we have these mountains, you know, running through uh, California, uh, and it's, you know, more complex than simply just stuff smashing together, but still, it's this folding, and it's this, the result of tectonic activity, right? Now, the best, best mountains we got, uh, definitely not the Appalachian, but what, what we have, they're the youngest mountains we have, um, significant mountain range anyway, it's the Himalaya, okay? So, looking at India right here, and it's actually the result of India back in Pangaea days, I think I pointed this out, in fact, let's look at the world map right here. India, the Indian subcontinent, all of South Asia, all of this used to be down here near South Africa. So we go back about 200 million years ago, India is down here. Since Pangaea has been drifting apart, India starts making its way up here. And everything's going fine until it runs into Asia. And that's what the Himalaya are. These incredible mountains that we have. And you can see, not only are they long, but also wide. I mean, it's just a massive, massive barrier between India and Tibet and, and China over here. Just really significant. It's all because India smashed into Asia, and it's still going in that direction. Again, very slow process. We're not seeing it happen. But 
it is. India is still working its way. It's still trying to push its triumph. It's, you know, it's really inspirational. It's, just, it's like a little engine that could. It's, it's just trying to go deeper and deeper in this direction into Asia. And Asia is massive. And the result is just all of this is getting pushed up, folded up. And we have these incredible mountains, right? These things are so big. Because you say, how big are they? The Himalaya are so big, they have their own gravitational pull, which is awesome. All right, so we have, like, and what this is showing, and this was discovered in dry, like, as the Brits are trying to map out and survey the Himalaya. When you're setting up your survey equipment, you use what's called a plumb bob, which is, it's just, it's like a lead weight um, that pulls down toward the center of the Earth. Right, so gravity is just holding it down. You use that to align everything, so that that's fine. It's just you know pulled toward the center because the Earth has its own gravitational pull. But the Himalaya, because they're so massive, they actually exert their own significant gravitational pull that trumps the the Earth uh, gravitational pull. Right, so as you get closer and closer with the survey equipment, stuff doesn't fall down it falls over, right? Meaning it's pulled, actually, because stuff doesn't actually fall down. It's pulled down by that gravitational force. It's pulled over toward the mountains. Right? That's crazy. These things are massive. You got this picture here. And I like this picture to show it to students because it makes it look like I took it um, out of the plane window. I stole this from people. I haven't been uh, over to the Himalaya. It's pretty far. Um, so, you know, but it's still, you can just see the mountains going forever. Uh, you have glacial activity in there, just significant. And of course, the real significance is we have our tallest mountain in the world. We have Mount Everest, right? The highest point on the planet, which is why the rich people, the white guys mainly, and guys um, mainly want to climb it, right? Because who wants to say, oh, yes, I climbed the second tallest mountain in the world? That doesn't sound, that doesn't pull chicks, right? But if you say, I climbed the tallest, yeah. Uh, and you can, you know, anybody can climb this thing. Uh, it just, it takes like about, you know, $100,000 at least for the permitting and to get the guy to take you up and play. I mean, these tents and, you know, the cool parkas uh, and all that stuff. It's a very expensive endeavor. And even that, there's still their traffic jams and stuff and people trying to climb, but it's just because it's the biggest, it's the tallest. And even to get to the top, that's a relatively new thing for humans to be able to do. It wasn't until the 1950s that Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay were the first humans to make it to the top, right? To actually get to the top and be at the top of the world. And that's awesome. Incredible stuff to just do it. Oh, we humans are fantastic. But since then, more and more people went up, and it became less about just trying to get to the top, but also about, like, let's let's study, let's see what's here. And so we've done, you know, different scientific expeditions, and some of those have been geologic, and we know exactly what rocks are at the top of the world, right? What, what rocks do we have up at the top of Mount Everest, at the highest point on the planet? Anybody know? You know? limestone. Now, what's limestone made of? You guys remember me talking about that? Where does limestone come from? And I know just based on past experience, if this were in a class, I'd say, what's limestone? And you guys would all go, like, I don't know. And then some of you would look frantically at your notes. You're not really looking for the answer. You're just trying to make it look like you're looking for the answer. And then I finally go, like, fine, I'll tell you. It, it's seashells, right? So it's that chemically precipitated sedimentary rock. Go back and check out that physical geology lecture to refresh your, your memory on this, but it's when the seashells, when that calcium stuff in there dissolves into the water, the water goes away, the calcium and the other minerals are left behind, and it lithifies, and it makes limestone. Meaning that wherever we see limestone, we know that used to be underwater. And that, the fact that we have that stuff, that limestone, up at the highest point on the earth, that's incredible evidence for plate tectonics and just goes to show how dynamic, meaning how ever-changing the Earth is. That what was down underwater is now at the highest point. That's phenomenal. And that's how powerful these convergent 
boundaries can be. Okay? And so it's why we study this stuff too, to get a sense of how these massive mountain ranges have formed. All right, now finally, our third one here, we have transform boundaries, meaning the plates sl uh, slide past one another. There's no converging, no spreading apart. It's a side to side thing. So you have one going this way and the other one going the opposite direction. Right? And we don't see volcanic activity with this stuff, but we can definitely find, you know, have earthquakes taking place here. And the world's most famous transform boundary, not the only one, uh, but the world's most famous one that we have is the San Andreas Fault, okay? where we have North America right here moving in one direction and the Pacific Plate, okay, which is part of North America. It's kind of fuzzy, but it's the idea we've got the North American Plate, the Pacific Plate, they're moving in opposite directions. And if you think back to those images, you see that, you know, of like the different plates, you have the North American Plate, it's being drawn, the arrow is going like in this direction, right? It's going toward uh, the Pacific Ocean. But here you can see, and this gets back into the idea of where it's more like a rubber sheet, it down in California, it, the North American plate is more or less going down, and the Pacific plate is more or less going up. And that boundary of the, the Pacific plate and the North American plate right here, we call the San Andreas Fault. And what's cool too here, Baja, California, that's a spreading boundary, right? So this stuff, we can have different types of boundaries existing at uh, along the same plate, right? Which is what we're seeing. The reason why Baja is sticking out, you know, off of Mexico, it's because that's spreading there. But up here, again, because of just the forces at work, all the complexities of what's happening with this tectonic stuff, we have it going in opposite directions. And so what this means is that, uh, you know, we in the Antelope Valley, so if you're in, you know, Lancaster, Palmdale, Tehachapi, Rosamond, whatever, while you're listening to this, you are currently on the North American plate, right? If you're in Acton or further south, you're on the Pacific plate. So LA itself down on the Pacific plate, moving in an opposite direction from us. And I think I mentioned already the San Andreas Fault, we can see it on the 14. If you're driving south of the 14, as you kind of start to drive up and then down, and there's that Avenue S exit, that whole valley right there, that's the San Andreas Fault. So, you know, Avenue S, if you're on the northern side of it, you're on the uh, North American plate. If you're on the southern side of it, you're on the Pacific plate, right? Now with this, like, yeah, the San Andreas Fault, and you can see it too, this is in California. I mean, it's just this incredible scar we have, you know, running through the state. And we're always terrified of it. Like, we live, I mean, my God, people, we live right next to the San Andreas Fault, this incredibly famous and scary just earthquake machine just waiting to just go, right? Um, actually, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. Honestly, like one thing we always kind of assume they're like, I mean, LA is just going to fall, you know, down into the Pacific. No, that's stupid. Um, no, of course, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is LA eventually, like in 60 million years, it'll get shoved underneath Alaska, right? It'll eventually be up there. So that's ridiculous. And in the you know, meantime, when that's happening, we're beachfront, right? Think about that. Yeah, start buying up land in Palmdale now because that's going to be, you know, the Malibu. And, 60 million years. But what's also cool with this is, is uh, since I'm not going to talk about earthquakes, I'll talk about this. It's the idea that as LA, this little bit of, of you know, granite stuff here on an otherwise basalt plate, as this is getting pushed relatively north, you know, here, like up in the Bay Area, this part of the coast, it's no big deal. Because the fault and the coastline and all that, it more or less, you know, works. It's all lined up and so it can relatively easily slide, you know, in these directions. But down here, we call this the big bend. And it starts like Gorman runs through Palmdale. So it's right where we are, my Antelope Valleyans. Um, at this area, the fault itself is more or less perpendicular with the actual direction of travel. And so what's happened is LA keeps just slamming into 
Palmdale, effectively. Uh, and I mean, that's that's cute, but come on. Like, LA's got some stuff going for it, but size isn't one thing. We've got all of North America backing us up, and they've got this tiny little sliver right here, right? So we're doing great up here in Palmdale, uh, but down here, uh, you know, in LA, it's just shattered, right? Like, picture a broken phone screen uh, with just all the lines radiating through it. That's what the rock underneath LA looks like because of the constant force. We have no idea exactly where all of the faults are running through LA. We've identified some big ones, but like with the Northridge quake, the reason why we know there's a fault running underneath Northridge is because we had an earthquake in the 90s. Right? We didn't know it existed until we had an earthquake, and the reason we didn't know is because we built Northridge on top of it. Right? We built all this stuff. We paved everything, so we can't see everything, but we now know, you know, especially with plate tectonics and understanding this stuff more, we've got a lot of faults underneath here. Um, we're doing relatively okay. We have our own with the Garlock to our north. Clearly, like I was discussing, that Ridgecrest, um, Trona uh, earthquake that we had not too long ago. You know, we're not immune from earthquakes, but the idea is that the San Andreas Fault isn't really an area of concern for those of us down here, right? When we have the next big one on the San Andreas, it will be up in San Francisco or somewhere down here, you know, in the desert near the Salton Sea, where you can have more significant fault slippage and movement and all of that. For us, we're cool, baby. Uh, and if you're in L.A., you're not worried about the San Andreas Fault. You're Instead, you're worried about all these other faults that are radiating out from here. But up here in the AV, perfectly safe. God's country, not a problem. Don't have to worry about earthquakes at all from the San Andreas Fault being of like true significant size. Clearly, we can solve earthquakes, but it's the idea we don't got to worry about the big one if we live here. Another great reason to live here in this beautiful, beautiful place. Um, so I guarantee we're not going to have a major nasty earthquake that's going to kill us all. Um, you know, from the San Andreas, right? And now that said, I'll also say, like, we also said uh, um, that, like, you know, hey, Japan, go ahead and build that nuclear uh, power plant right here because there's no way, based on this, you know, subduction zone and all this stuff, there's no way you're going to have an earthquake that's really, like, really not. You're not going to get to, like, a 9.0 earthquake at all. Build the power plant. You'll be fine. And then they have the earthquake and radiation's going everywhere. And we say, oops, um, you know, we, we got some more data. We learned some more. We're still learning about this stuff. We're pretty confident that, you know, from an earthquake standpoint, it's okay to be on the San Andreas Fault right down here, not any of these other places. But that said, we're constantly seeing what we don't know because this, this whole theory is still so young, right? So we're totally fine. Unless we're not, and I tell you what, if we have like a really bad earthquake happen on the San Andreas Fault and like you die or whatever, I'll give you some extra credit points. I'll go back, right? I'll look you up, I'll go back, and I'll fix your grade retroactively so you get that A plus in the class, and I really apologize for steering you wrong. All right. Um, so, yeah, all right. So, uh, all right, back to plates and all of that. You tell, I'm just getting tired of this whole uh, stay-at-home thing and talking into a computer and all that. I'm just starting to ramble more and more. Um, yeah, just deal with it. You can, you know, fast forward if you need to. Now, this is showing, like I've already shown more or less, but still uh, showing the idea of plate boundaries, you know, so we have our Pacific plate, our North American plate here, and we see volcanoes and earthquakes, and you can just see, and through like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, same kind of deal, where you have these plate boundaries, you have these significant geologic hazards, right? But not always, okay? Not, it's not always the case. Like Hawaii and a lot of the islands we have out in the Pacific, those don't actually make sense. Because like Hawaii is volcanic, okay? So therefore it's the result of all this tectonic stuff. It's magma upwelling and volcanoes forming and lava spilling out and, and all of that. But it's in the middle of a plate. So it's not a case where it has to be at the boundary, we also have what are called hot spots, right? And a hot spot is simply a spot in the mantle that is hot, that's hotter than some other places of the mantle nearby, 
And so because it's hotter, we have that convection and the magma works its way up and we can get a volcano forming. And as that volcano gets big enough, it becomes a volcanic island, right? So Hawaii, which we're looking at right here, more or less, um, Hawaii is this volcanic island chain. The big island of Hawaii is that bigger island. It's got an active volcano, um, you know, that makes up the island itself. But the reason why Hawaii is there, because that's where the hot spot happens to be. So there's magma actively coming up, spilling out. The lava spills out. It cools. It forms molten salt. That's how the island of Hawaii has been built up over the years. And the volcano, it's not like a big deal um, because it's, and we're not getting into the different types of eruptions, but it's not like an explosive thing that at any minute all the people on the island of Hawaii could, you know, be wiped out instantly. Uh, it's an, an effusive eruption. The lava just kind of spills out and you can avoid it for the most part. So people can live in harmony with the volcano that's there. And that's cool. But given enough time, like millions of years, eventually that big island of Hawaii is going to move away from the hot spot. And that's really the fact that we have these other little islands near Hawaii. Those things all used to be where the big island is today. They used to be over that hot spot, but they've moved away. And as they move away, there's more erosion. There's no new basalt that's forming to build it up. So eventually these islands disappear because the erosion continues and these things go underneath the water. And we found, again, with more of this cool mapping the ocean floor, we found that if you look underneath the water out in the Pacific, you have this whole line of islands that used to be um, on this spot, this hot spot, but have long since moved away and therefore eroded and we can't even see them. They're what we call seamounts, where they used to be islands, now they're underneath the water. So not only is it just kind of cool to see, and we have these in Hawaii, we can have them in the middle of continents too. They're, you know, they're just kind of cool to see, uh, but they're great for tracking how plates have moved. So in measuring uh, and mapping out these different seamounts and these former Hawaiian islands that exist, we get a sense of how the Pacific plate has moved. This is one of the ways in which we can draw those arrows and get a sense of how you know, it's moving currently and how it used to move in the past. Some of these things change. You can see it kind of does this little dog leg thing right here. It's currently going in this direction, but it used to be going more like that. Um, so that's what a hot spot is all about. That just explains some of these weird anomalies. All right. Does that make sense? We, we cool? Maybe? Yeah? All right. All right, good. So next time. We're going to get out of this geology nonsense and get into more stuff, uh, you know, that we geographers get into, which is geomorphology. I'll explain what that is, why we care about it. We'll look at cool caves and stuff like that. All right. All right. Stay safe out there, geographers. And I'll talk to you later.